Blog Talk Radio. It's the V-Spot. I'm your host, Dr. Vic Tater. My co-host is Bill Foster. V-Spot Radio is brought to you by Planet Dictator Blog Network. Get everything you need and a few things you truly do not want. Only at Planet Dictator.
they liked our script a lot, and just at that same time, they had an opening because uh, Jay Kogan and Wally Waladarski were leaving. So uh, they offered us a job, and uh, everything worked out for the best. Uh, when you're writing a uh, when you were writing with Josh Weinstein, how exactly would that process work? Would y'all uh, come up with jokes together? But who would it like do the actual writing, like actually having to put it into a script? You know, it, uh, our process evolved over the years. Um, uh, let me tell you what the process is now that I use, and uh, Josh and I use in projects we work together. And then I will tell you the process which we used back then. <clears throat> right now, basically, what happens is you just kind of you do a rough draft, and then you polish it up, and then you do a better draft, and you fix things that aren't working, and that's basically the normal process. Uh, the process we used at The Simpsons was, in retrospect, I suppose it worked out for the best, but it was the most torturous possible process. It was the opposite of that. It was basically that we would start from page one, and we would just, we wouldn't, every single thing had to be perfect, and we would write from page one to page 60, and in order, and do it together, basically just sit in front of the computer together and not move along until every single line was perfect. Um, in retrospect, I think that probably was a waste of time and because we were always writing 20 more pages worth of stuff than we really ultimately needed to write um, because we didn't have a rough draft to begin with. So that, that was the process. I wouldn't recommend it for anybody. I would use that second process which is writing a rough draft first and then coming back and writing what you really need to put in this show as opposed to a lot of extra stuff <clears throat> that isn't needed. That's right. I find it weird oh. that you would say that it would be that uh, rough and rigid of a structure since it seemed when we would go back and see some of the old Simpsons, it would seem like uh, you would have like a base outline for a plot and then you would just kind of cram as many jokes as you can that fit in with the plot. <clears throat> we would do that except that we had way too much. We always had way too much. Every episode... I think, you know, not just our episodes, but every episode from the time we were there was probably at least 150% too long. And so there would be way more material written than needed to be written. And maybe that, you know, and ultimately maybe that worked out well because there would be so much to choose from, except that, as I'm sure you know, sometimes people had to, had to cut out stuff. We always ended up, ended up having to cut out stuff that was funny because otherwise the plot wouldn't make any sense. Sometimes... Um, we ended up cutting out stuff, the plot, and then the plot didn't make any sense because there were, you know, there were you, you had to make a choice between the jokes and the plot. And at some point, you know, things are going to suffer if you have to cut one of those things too deeply. <clears throat> uh, let me ask one thing, uh, and this is like skipping way ahead, but I have to know this now, and I'm going to forget if I don't. Why did they cut out the Richard Simmons robot? And who you know, Mr. I'm going to tell you about that. There? You guys. Everybody loved the Richard Simmons robot, but at the time, we, many of us considered it to be super hacky. And by hacky, I mean something that everybody was doing on every – at that point in time, right now, looking back, whatever, 15 years, you know, it's like, hey, Richard Simmons joke, that's hilarious. But at the time, and I'm seeing like, what, 1993 here, every hacky comedian was doing Richard Simmons jokes. And uh, it was on everything, you know, it was on Jim, it was Jim Leno was doing it, and I don't even know if he was on the air regularly at that point, but, like, let's just say that the air was oversaturated with Richard Simmons jokes, and it was the feeling of most of the writers, but not all of them, that the Simpsons shouldn't be doing that, uh, that it was that we should come up with, I don't know, ultimately what was in there, was the dogs with bees or something? It wasn't like... <laughs> he lost whatever, the door. <laughs> whatever ultimately was put in there was not... I don't think it was probably better than the Richard Simmons robot, but it was not Richard Simmons. And I think it, I have to say that, you know, people at the Simpsons that, uh, are, uh, are and were comedy snobs, and I think we felt that that was a little beneath us to do Richard Simmons. But ultimately, uh, I think putting it on the air years later, uh, it was it was pretty it's pretty funny. Uh, well, actually, I remember, you, I remember you would say, like, on the commentary, you would spend, uh, like, so long just making the actual plot, then you would spend like uh, probably like 12 to 14 hours just running little jokes that you would flash for like a second, like on uh, billboards. So, like, you yes. have like, oh you my know, god, we spent so much time doing that stuff. It really did, yes. Uh, uh, and I hope that, I mean, it, it seems like people are still enjoying it all these years later because we really did devote a lot of time to stuff that I think only maybe less than 1% of the audience even noticed. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, it's one of those things, Joe, in hindsight, with DVD, uh, since the advent of DVD, it's one of those things that's paid off, I guess. Good, good. Uh, okay.
Okay, uh, let me, uh, when you were writing uh, and Marge Gets a Job, the one thing that stands out for me in this episode is, number one, is I think this is the first time Smithers did something very, very evil. <laughs> what, what, kidnapped Tom Jones? Yeah, okay, you know, see, this is an example of what happens, and I think that that's a, I love that episode. It is, what happens when in the course of many episodes is that at top, you start out with something, that plot, that a story that's pretty realistic. Right, and then, and this happened with a number of episodes, especially Marge episodes, because Marge isn't really a fountain of comedy, you know. Like, there's a she doesn't have that many failings and shortcomings like Homer and Bart do. And so, what happens is in Marge episodes, often you have to start throwing in, or we had to start throwing in crazy stuff to um, overcome the shortcomings of Marge as a comedy character. So. Each draft, it got crazier and crazier and crazier. The draft, um, initial draft, was pretty, pretty believable. And then, uh, as time went on, it went, it got more and more nuts. That also happened with the other March episode that we wrote that year, which was that March when March was to jail, which was yeah. like pretty. Be- I think it was pretty believable in the first draft. And I mean, it's much funnier, but it's totally insane. That whole all that crazy crap with Jimmy Carter, where history great, history's greatest monster, which we all love now. <laughs> At the time, I think Josh and I were like, "That doesn't make any sense." I mean, it, it was supposed to be, it was supposed to be a little more, bit more like a second or third season episode that was pretty believable, and instead it ended up being like one of the craziest episodes of that whole year. But you know, I think that that paid off ultimately. Those decisions, which I would not have made at that time, uh, I well, think I can now made them. Well, considering about four seasons later, you would actually have a Bond villain as, as a nice guy to just show up and just uh, play it off as nothing. Right. Well, that was, you know, that's what happened. That was, that's what happened between seasons. I don't have to tell you guys. Between season three and season eight of the show, uh, a lot of the boundaries that initially had been there uh, dissolved over time. And there were certain milestones where that happened, like Homer going into space. And I remember this was so controversial at the, at, at the time. We were like, Homer's supposed to be a regular guy, and the show was supposed to be about the travails of this guy's, regular suburban guy's family life, you know, and his job and whatever. And here you have a story where this guy is going to be launched into space. He's going to be the most famous guy in America. And, and believe me, it tore the staff apart at the time. Um, ultimately, because so much work was done on the episode, I think it came out really well. But... And then, then after that, there were a number. I mean, probably beginning with the monorail episode, things just, and then progressing all the way up to what you're talking about, um, things got looser and looser as time went on. And again, that's probably good because it was keeping the story, keeping the show fresh. I mean, how many episodes can, could you do about, like, you know, Bart getting an F or Homer getting a new job? And there's probably been, at this point, there's probably been several hundred of them. But at the time, we were trying to um, mix things up. Uh, you know, uh, just because I don't want to forget this, uh, the Jimmy Carter thing, when I was a kid, I thought that was hilarious because I thought it was such a disproportionate response to a, ma- to a former president. When I got older and I saw how people respond to Jimmy Carter, it became even funnier. Now that you point that out, I think it's true. It, because it was like, he was such a mild-mannered guy who was building houses for, ha- at that point, was building houses for poor people and Habitat for Humanity. And that just because I guess his presidency wasn't really that successful, this vast overreaction. But now people really, yes, because of the um, the Republican uh, propaganda machine, I guess you would call it. We do people really do seriously think of Jimmy Carter as a as a monster, which is just is just crazy. But well, know, this guy it, one time told me he said uh, he said uh, with Jimmy Carter, I paid more for a gallon of milk than I ever have. And this other guy was like, Yeah, you pay more now than you did then. What's your point? Right. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, the Margin Chains episode. Uh, whose ideal was that? Like the general concept. I don't remember. It was definitely assigned to us there because that was our first <laughs> job on staff. It might have been um, an idea that had been around for a while, um, and it was it was assigned to. You know, that's what happens when you're the low guys on the totem pole. You have to do the Marge episodes, and that's what happened with us that year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, how would that work uh, the sh- as far as the show went? Now, would guys, uh, so you wouldn't be pitching your own ideals, or would it be just uh, at the beginning of the year, guys would just put uh, ideals in a pot? 
Well, what happens is, at least um, back then, uh, we had these things called story retreats, and everybody, twice a year, like a lot of the ways that things, let me just take a step back here, a lot of the ways that stuff was done on The Simpsons uh, in the 90s was taken from the way that things were done under Jim Brooks at Mary Tyler Moore and Taxi uh, in the eight, 70s and 80s. And they had these things called story retreats where the guy, everybody, all the writers would come up with stories. And in those days, you know, in the days of Taxi and Mary Tyler Moore, they would be like, these guys would go to Palm Springs, they would go to Hawaii, and they would like play golf and have fun and do all this crazy crap and, and, and then work on the stories. Um, by the time that The Simpsons rolled around and we were working there, we would go to a hotel, a conference room in a hotel that was a block from the office. And it would be one day, and we wouldn't even get to spend the night or anything, you know. So it was like a big meeting, basically. Um, anyway, all the writers would bring their stories. We have them twice a year, and people would bring their stories, and everybody would um, try to really get the best stuff they had worked out for these retreats because everybody would be there. Um, you know, Jim Brooks would be there, and Matt Groening would be there, and sometimes James Simon would be there, uh, all the writers and all the assistants who take notes, and you'd have to be focus of attention for a good 10 minutes as you told the story, so you'd want them to be great. Um, and that's that was the process. Now, where we come up with this stuff, I mean, from all over the place. I mean, from our own lives, from articles in the news. Josh and I got a lot of different ideas from just from USA Today, frankly, back in those days. Um, straight the gambling episode, and my lovely Stacey both came from articles in USA Today. Uh, what was oh. the first episode that you uh, got the pitch that actually got made? It was the ga- it was the gambling episode you just were talking about. <laughs> <All right. laughs> that's a good, uh, that's we probably move to talk about Mission Hill, just so we can have some yeah. time. Uh, <laughs> well, we know it's kind of based on the indie uh, comics, but which I can't remember which ones you said specifically uh, influenced the design. Uh, it was a combination between the work of Dan Klaus, who did this comic called Eight Ball. Um, and uh, Peter Bagg, who did this comic called Hate back then, which was also known as the Buddy Bradley story or whatever. Um, oh, okay. He was inspired, got inspired by those things. And yeah, I got a lot of hate influence. Stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, definitely. We both, we love, both Josh and I love that material, and we kind of tried to use our Simpsons skills to bring a world like the world depicted in those comics, uh, you know, into the primetime TV world. Um, and it did not, as you know, probably it didn't succeed. It was a miserable failure in the uh, primetime TV world, but it had a second life on Adult Swim where it probably was a uh, better fit. Uh, uh, me and Neil were discussing this last night. Uh, does, does Penis, Penis, Penis Guy have a name? Like, no. what's his name in the script? It doesn't? I would have to look it up. I, You know what? I, he doesn't have a name. He's, a, he's not like Just Stamp the Ticket Guy in The Simpsons, who who goes by the phrase, you just call Just Just Stamp the Ticket Guy. Um, I think it's just like a it's just businessman or something. It's not, there's no good name for him. Sorry, sorry, the answer is like, so unsatisfying. It's kind of like the guy who goes yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, uh, in, one, in one episode, he was called the, the uh, Homer referred to him as that jerk that always says yes. Yeah, that's Frank. I think it's called Frank Nelson. You know, that's the character that is from that. You guys know that that's an, I'm not. The Simpsons have not invented yeah. that guy. He's from Iowa. Yeah, he's based on some old. Yeah, he's based on an old. I saw him on an episode of Sanford and Son. Yeah, an old he, character he actor. I can't remember his character name. Character actor. I think his name was. I think his name was Frank Nelson, and he was yeah. definitely around since the fifties. And he did that. Did that. Yeah, this kind of thing in a lot of. And I love Lucy, but probably a lot of shows for the fifties. 50s and 60s, and the Simpsons just kind of resuscitated him and <laughs> whole hog and took his thing and <laughs> started using it. Uh, now, uh, with you... Mission Hill, uh, one question with Mission Hill, uh, with, like, Kevin and Andy, are these kind of uh, semi-personal uh, accounts of your Josh Weinstein? Yes. They're, uh, all the characters, I can't tell you who, but they're all people that we know. But everyone in Mission Hill is either someone that we knew or someone that we met or a combination of people like that. Um, but many of them are still our friends, so I can't talk about I can't talk about where they came from. You know, watching the when I was watching the the first few episodes, I couldn't help but thinking that Andy was a very good brother. Yeah, in retrospect, he actually was pretty good. He was gr- he was grumpy, but I think you know he did have a certain sense of responsibility, uh, which I think 
ultimately kind of funny to see him being dragged along into being kind of a responsible adult father figure for Kevin, who yeah, was so annoying. I was telling Neil that with most people, I think the pilot of the last five minutes when Andy would tell his mom to piss off. Right, right. Uh, uh, going back to uh, Simpsons, because, again, you've got done so much stuff, you know, it's a lot of grand. Uh, how did you get the job? How did you and Josh Weinstein get the job of being showrunner? You know, uh, it was a combination of, of fortuitous events, uh, one of which was that Conan, who was the next person in line to be the showrunner, suddenly became a famous talk show host and left the show. Um, because at that point, jo- uh, a lot of – Josh and I, after being there for only about a year and a half, became the most senior people because uh, many of the people from the first few years, like Mike Reese and Al Jean and uh, John Reedy and Jeff Martin, uh, all suddenly left. And very quickly, Conan was the most senior person, and we were the second most senior people. And then, Conan, miraculously, in 1993, Conan became the host of Late Night and, le- and instantly left. Um, and then uh, after David Merkin left, the, uh, it seemed like we probably just had the most experience and knowledge of the show. Uh, and I think that he uh, put us up for the job. So uh, that's how – that's the process as, as I know it. I, I'm sure there was other stuff behind the scenes that I wasn't privy to, but that's basically the story I think I pieced together. Okay, when you got the job, did you ever have any attitude? Were there any things that you wanted to change about the way the show was ran, like it could be a minor or something that you didn't think they were doing before, or were you just trying not to uh, mess things up too bad? Um, all of the above, I'd say. We, like, we had a plan of what we wanted to do, the kind of shows we liked, which was we wanted to make it just like season three all over again. We always thought season three. I still think season three is the best. And we, By the way, I should say we weren't even there on season three. We were just watching the show as fans. Uh, I still think that season three is like the best season of television ever made by anything ever anywhere. And so our goal was really to just make another season three. And literally we sort of mapped out, I told this story before, but we looked at season three and we're like, what's the composition of episodes? How many Bart episodes were there? How many episodes were there, um, you know, that were emotional versus how many that were just crazy? And uh, also we figured, well, every season's got to have at least one thing. So Bob, every season's got to have one itchy and scratchy. Um, so that combined with the fact that we had a more, we wanted more realistic episodes. Um, the majority of the family wants to be pretty realistic, which is why we started out with that, Home Sweet Home, Diddly Dumb, Doodly, one written by VD that was a real throwback to the early days of the show. Um, so that was what we did. We basically just wanted to copy what we thought had been great about the show in its early years. And, you know, but keeping in mind that a lot of boundaries had already been pushed during seasons four, five, and six, so we had more to play with. You know, we weren't so confined to it being domestic comedy. We could have, we had to have crazier stuff in there. <laughs> Okay. I guess that's uh, why that you was... did more uh, crazy stuff like the Simpsons spinoff showcase and uh, 138 <laughs> episodes spectacular. Just trying oh, to yeah, break into thing. norms. That was, yeah, we did want to have at least, we, I think we reserved at least two episodes per year for just going that shit crazy, which was like, we felt like, you know, given that we were making 22 or even 24 episodes a year, we felt that it was, given all the realistic, emotional, grounded ones we were doing, we felt that we also wanted to do two that push the boundaries that were just crazy uh, and broke down the walls. And the, I think one of the first ones we did was 22 short films. Yes. And the other, the other two you mentioned that were just like, they bent, bent the format, they bent the genre and what, whatever, we, you know, what expectations you had from a sitcom. We thought, why not, what better place to play with them? Also because, and I'm sure you guys have heard this before, that we didn't ever get any notes from the network. And it, it's a, you know, I don't know how many shows in the history of television have been in that position, but it can't be more than like 10 over the past 50 years of television where the show was so blessed through various circumstances that we didn't have executives meddling the show. I mean, nobody, we didn't answer to anybody at all. So we could do whatever we wanted and they had to broadcast it. And it was a rare treat to be able to do that. 
Uh, you know, the spinoff showcase, that has probably my favorite line in the history of the show that did not belong to, to a regular character. And it's when Big Daddy's getting ready to run, and he goes, oh, Lord, have mercy. I wish I weren't so fast. Yeah, that is funny. And I say that to this day. Anytime I have to do something that requires me to move fast. <laughs> uh, in the episode Sideshow Bob Roberts, now, and this, is, uh, this is one of mine and Neil's favorite bits ever, when Homer suddenly gets thrown out of a car by the Archie gang, and Moose goes, duh, stay out of Riverdale. Yes. I, just, I, I hadn't thought of that in a long time, but that is <laughs> like that. That's crazy. Uh, how did you? How did that bit come up? Because it was the same thing. Because you get the feeling that Homer had been involved in something that we weren't privy to. Like it was like yeah. it was almost like it was a B plot that wasn't being shown. Exactly. That's you. You put. That's exactly what it's supposed to imply that he'd somehow been screwing. Well, first of all, we were big fans of Archie. Both Josh and I were big fans of Archie, and a number of things that I think people think The Simpsons made up actually came from Archie. Like I'm pretty sure that Yoink came from Archie. Um, and I'm pretty sure that Eep also came from Arch, you know, Eep, <laughs> which people do. Lionel Hutz did it in that um, Mark uh, Jail one. I'm, I'm frankly sure that both, I'm, I'm 80% sure that both Yoink and Eep came from Archie, and uh, God bless Archie for not suing us for using them. Anyway, uh, what you're saying, that was just basically a quick joke that we came up with to end whatever scene that was, but we loved, as you said, that it implied that Homer that Springfield had there obviously there was another fictional city somewhere nearby besides Springfield it was Riverdale where the Archie gang lived and Homer had somehow been causing trouble there <laughs> but we didn't get to see any more about it and uh, later he said uh, and again this, uh, I love this bit later when he's in the car he's reading an Archie comic seething yes yes uh, now when you were showrunner uh uh, what was your favorite episode uh, come along during that time that you were running the show? I don't know. They, um, see, the thing is that, like, it, I have to say that over time, my opinion of various episodes have changed, and they have changed historically, too. Like, nobody really liked 22 short films at the time. Uh, and nobody really liked the whole Frank Grimes thing at the time, too. And now I can't stop seeing everybody saying how it's a favorite episode, and Ricky Jervis as, uh, saying it's the best episode of television ever. And I'm like, well, Mr. Jervis, you should give me a call then. <laughs> uh, you know, nobody uh, – at that time, nobody liked that either. Um, and I think that a number of things were – about many of those episodes were shocking and, and off-putting to viewers back then. But over time, as, as – People's senses of humor have changed, and people have had a chance to see the episode in a different light. I think they've come to enjoy them. Anyway, uh, at the time, I think, you know, I still really like a lot of the more standard ones, like the 300-pound Homer one, the king-size Homer. But I really did have a section for 22 short films. But at the time, I was kind of – I at the time, I didn't keep talking about it because it seemed like nobody liked it. So I just shut up about it. But um, – there were other ones. I definitely, I think we all felt at the time that the on villain one, you all, you only moved twice. And that was Greg Daniels' story, uh, which is a super solid story. And the script by Schwarzwalder, um, you know, just added all these great details. But um, I think that may be one of the ones that at the time we all, the, the one that we all liked at the time that has also been liked over the years. You only moved twice. That's the end of it. I like to go on the East Coast. I know that some people don't seem to like those type. Of, uh, some people don't seem to like those endings, but some do. Like some didn't like the prisoner ending. But, uh, some of those are actually just kind of hilarious. Just kind of end that way. Right. Well, which one? Which about, uh, this was an ending. Uh, this was after you left. Uh, the computer wore men's shoes. There was a, Homer oh, yeah, got yeah. captured and put on an island because he had made up these lies, and it turned out one of them was true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, okay. No, I don't I only vaguely remember that. <laughs> okay, you only the thing with the ending of you only moved twice when Homer had the Denver Broncos, the thing I found funny about that, he's very sad, but two years later in real life the Broncos won two Super Bowls in a row. Dude, I was just thinking about this recently and I regret that it was the Denver Broncos. Here's the thing. It was supposed to be the Houston Oilers. This is in the original draft of the script. <laughs> 
the original draft of the script, and, and even if it's all the way up to like the animatic of the, it was Houston Oilers, which was perfect because the Houston Oilers were always in the basement. Nobody cared about the Houston Oilers, but they were moving the next year to become whatever Tennessee Titans. And yeah. is that what happened to them? And so we just were like, we can't have it be Houston Oilers. Nobody's going to remember who they are. It doesn't make any sense. And nobody's going to, like, 10 years from now, people are going to think that's a made-up team. So uh, it became Denver Broncos, and we didn't. nobody was really satisfied with that. One, because I know George Meyer, who was there, who's also, first of all, a huge Broncos fan, but also, you know, he, he liked to get things right. And I think we had, like, even the, John Elway was – Receiving in that when you see with the Broncos on the lawn, the numbers are all wrong, and John Elway is being receiver rather than the quarterback, and they, there's a lot of screwed up stuff about that. And in retrospect, I wish we had picked a team that was a worse team that would be still around. Anyway, I, 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 that's the first time I've said that, but I wish we had um, fixed that and not had it in the Broncos. <laughs> <laughs> well, that just works so much better than Houston Oilers, you know, just because they're in Texas, and you never hear people in Texas, even back then, talk about the Oilers. Right, right. Well, as, as at the time, the rationale was, we don't. This team is going to be gone next year, so we better change it. The same thing happened with, you know, by the way, at the end of the George Bush episode, that was supposed to be Nixon, you know, not Ford who moved next. Uh, all the way up till again the animatic or whatever, it was Nixon who moved to next door, and was really friendly to to Homer. But Nixon died during the course of that episode, and we were, like, debating who it should be. For a while, for a few days, it was Bob Dole, uh, and then <laughs> we decided that we figured out, like, oh, wait, Ford looks just like Homer if you draw it like this, and then we made it Ford. Now, was it still uh, going to be Ghost Menace jokes on that episode, though? What? Was it still going to be, uh, like, Ghost Menace, though? Or you, uh, not part of the writing staff? Wait, sorry, uh, I didn't hear you... that part. Uh, the George oh, Bush episode, uh, the George Bush episode when Bart was harassing him, was it always intended to be like a Dennis the Menace parody? Yes, it was supposed to be just that you, that's exactly right. Okay, how did that idea come about to have, uh, Homer get into a fist fight with, uh, George Bush? That was an idea that Josh and I had that we had been saving up for a while. Um, uh, we had it during, it was one of the ideas we, we were messing around with during the, uh, so when David Merkin was running the show, but we never did it for whatever reason. And then when we took over, we assigned it to Ken, Ken Keeler wrote that, right? We assigned it to Ken Keeler, and um, it was just basically we felt like George Bush was be- – we didn't want to do a political – this is another episode that was pretty much hated at the time, um, by uh, certainly by a number of people on the staff, including Harry Shearer, uh, who gave us no end of crap about it, that it, we didn't – it was not political in any way. We were like, George Bush – the real life George Bush is an old seems seems like an old grouch, and having someone like that be Homer's neighbor, it actually kind of that and Frank Grimes were two similar ideas. It might have been the same idea at one point, but split into two episodes because it was like, what about an old grouchy guy who takes everything seriously? That seems like somebody who would be seriously annoyed by Homer. And then I think the idea was, oh, let's make it George Bush because. I don't know. I don't know how that came about, but that was that became that episode, and the Homer's enemy became Frank Grimes' episode, um, and they definitely have similar underpinnings. Uh, one thing I noticed is a lot. Of, uh, just now realized, you thinking about it, that a lot of the episodes that happened when you and Josh Weinstein were showrunners, that has been mined a lot in later years. Like uh, Frank Grimes, like they'll still do things where Homer's still harassing Frank Grimes in the grave, like he took his tombstone. Yeah, that one, we needed a super dark. The thing about that one is, and it's very clear, that episode, let me say this, and I, I think I said this before in the past. Homer, we had we had to turn up Homer's bad behavior in that episode because he, if he was just acting kind of normal, it wouldn't be that funny. And so Homer's behavior is consciously dialed up to be worse than usual, or at least usual at that time, throughout the whole episode. And we were, at the end, we were like, we're gonna, he's going to have to do something horrific, <laughs> horrific in a horrifically bad taste to really make it clear what this episode is about. And then we're like, oh, well, it's a funeral. He can be – because the, – and I don't have to repeat. Let me just say this, state the obvious. The whole point is the show takes place in Homer's universe. And in Homer's universe, Homer wins at the end of the episode no matter what. You know, that's the way that The Simpsons works. You know, you don't usually have an episode where Homer doesn't win or things don't get reset at the end. 
Um, and so Frank Grimes was the unfortunate victim of that. The fact that the universe was against him. I think when I was, uh, you know, I remember when we were watching this on DVD, Neil was disturbed by how much I was laughing as Frank Grimes was being lowered into his grave. Yeah, it's dark. It is dark, man. People, as I said, <laughs> back then, people did not like that. It was, it, uh, we got one letter. The thing is, uh, this is back when people sent letters to TV shows, which seems so antiquated now. But, like, all we got was one letter from some guy, who I think some guy who worked on, like, an army base or something in somewhere in California who said, who just said, you guys nailed it, you know. That's the frustrating, that we nailed what it was really like to work with a bunch of dopes. And this guy, obviously, I, he felt that the people he worked with were idiots and were wrecking everything. And this guy, he really summed up what we had. We knew that it got through to this one guy. And so we put that letter up on the wall and we enjoyed it. And later we heard other people liked it, but that was years later. Yeah, uh, growing up, you know, because like for uh, me and Neil, you know, The Simpsons, you know, I, I, I can think of the number of Simpsons episodes I hate. Like, you know, and I can't say on one hand, and usually if I watch the episode again, I laugh at it. But So when I got on the Internet, the biggest surprise for me was, like, there's people that hate The Simpsons? Yeah, man, I'm telling you, you look back at those things at SNPP and the Springfield Nuclear Power Plant, and you'll see that people – There's this is what I learned from reading that and, and over the years, is that there's – you can never – and I think this really goes back to that whole, like, you can please all the people some of the time or some of the people all the time or whatever, like – I've never seen a Simpsons episode that more than 80% of the audience liked. Uh, and there's always at least maybe 10 to 20%, even in the best case scenario, that hate it with a violent passion. And I and I watched, I tried to figure out why that happens. And I think a lot of people's senses of humor are a very personal thing. Um, and I've seen it happen with Josh, you know, like and with Josh and me, where like we watch an episode of some other show and one of us loves it and one of us hated it. And it's just because we later realized that it was because someone was in a bad mood, you know, that night or whatever, and just, like, wasn't in the, didn't want to be amused or didn't, you know, there was something in it that struck them wrong. Uh, and it is a personal thing. But anyway, if you look back at those comments uh, from season three, four, five, six, seven, that people were posting on the Internet at that time, it seemed like the end of the world was coming. People were so outraged, or at least 30% of the audience, thought that every episode was the worst episode ever. And, uh, you know, that's where that phrase came came from, uh, was all TV Simpsons. So I had a, yeah, we have, yeah, well, I, we have contested I episodes like that. Like, even on Mission Hill, we're kind of contest, we've been contested because I didn't want to watch the Lamborghini episode again. Uh-huh. Just because I've seen it so many times. That it just, uh, that, I don't know. Uh, just, just something about the episode just kind of rose me wrong. Like, the fact he has to spend a bike. How much was it for that windshield wiper? Or it was like a whole lot just to pay for that or the gas. Yeah, it was a couple hundred yeah. dollars. Well, you know, we've almost gotten to fist fights over some things. Like we get into fist fight, uh, like we almost got to a fist fight in season over season eight because I said Brother from Another Series is a better episode than You Only Move Twice. And I love You Only Move Twice. I just think the episode with Sideshow Bob's brother is better. <laughs> I'm, you know, I don't agree. I don't agree with you, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm happy that you have that opinion. I feel you know, like that. Does. Thing is, I know I'm in the minority. Well, he also likes Trash the Titans better than you know, it's the movie It's a good episode. It's a good episode, yeah, but, you know, it doesn't – and it's also because I'm just um, – <clears throat> I felt that, like, you only moved tw- twice had – mainly because of the work that Greg did, had a plot that worked – every single thing came off like clockwork in the plot, whereas in, the, in, in Brother from another series, I think the plot – and Ken, who wrote it, I'm sure would agree with this because of all the – Oops, we had to jump through writing it. That the plot has a lot of kind of forced parts of it. Uh, that's not to say the character isn't funny. The character of Cecil is great, but like, you only move twice. Ah, this is boring. I don't need to go into this. <laughs> you, uh, yeah. you know, I just think it's more. I think you only move twice is, is more is a more elegantly constructed episode. <laughs> well, well, one yeah, more yeah, uh, question. Just for uh, we have time. Whose idea was it to have Bonham McDonald the meaning of life? In that episode where Andy has just like the worst day ever, you know, I don't remember whose idea it was. I do remember that we needed something that could come off that we weren't going to show the whole thing. Like <laughs> it, it had to be, it had to be something that you could in a split second, because we weren't going to reveal it because it was supposed to be. The joke was that <laughs> for those of you who didn't see this episode, the joke was Posey is Posey, the kind of spacey hippie girl character, is meditating, and for the whole episode. And at the end, she's finally 
finally gotten to the point where she's going to reach the meaning of life, and she's interrupted just at that split second that it's being revealed, and we only get to see a fraction of it. And for people who freeze frame, it appears that what she's seeing is a giant statue of Ronald McDonald. <laughs> so I think it was just, I don't know who came up with it, but it was a combination of us and probably the designers who were like, what, what could you possibly show in a split second that people might be able to figure out? You know, and you're only seeing a fraction of it, I think, as well. Yeah, it's not very long. Well, it's also that's kind of a uh, almost uh, could be deemed uh, a depressing episode because that's just like uh, I can't remember all the terrible things that happened to Andy in that episode. I don't think it really got shown uh, get uh, any good resolution. It's just that well, it's just, it makes people get shit on all day. Oh, oh no, no, at the end, no, no, at the end, it's got that happy ending. Remember where whatever yeah. Michelle yeah. Butterfield gives him a yeah, kiss and. and Invites him to That's come awesome. to the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony or something. Well, yeah, well uh, so Kevin awesome. gets to that, but he missed it. Uh, <laughs> right, uh, okay, I, I do it. remember that. Uh, okay, uh, you know, going back to Brother from Another Series, you know, that is the only ending of a Simpsons episode that bothers me to this day. <laughs> what is the <laughs> Bob memory about the episode? Children. Oh, Bob saves the children. Right. Well, this is yeah, Terminator 2. Right. That's how the whole thing is. It's Terminator 2, right? It's the story of the whole plot is, is basically Terminator 2, where the previous villain, uh, there's a new villain worse than the previous villain who has to now become the defender. It's, it is like, uh, you have to give away too much of the, <laughs> the secret of writing, but like that is basically the story. The whole idea was let's do Terminator 2 with Sideshow Bob and his brother being the team one thousand. <laughs> it's just like to this day, though. It is just, it, uh, also there's this thing I do to my own nephews when they're being bad. I'll take them to their mother and I'll say, "Your children are no more." Right. <laughs> and I'll hold them up, scruff of their necks. Yes, yeah, in a bunch of what is this? In a bunch of misbehaved hooligans or something? What is this? Take a part of that sentence. Okay, uh, uh, let me ask you about Cleveland Show. Well, because we've only got a few more minutes, and I like because I I really love both the episodes of Cleveland Show you wrote. The first cool. episode had a it had a great line in it, where about uh, where he's like, "Oh, Don, I'm sure I'll just be I'll be just as sad at, at your funeral. My third wife will be mad at me." Yeah, I don't. You know, I have to say that the Cleveland Show. When I work on the Cleveland Show, it is, you know, they are a very collaborative process, and it's more like. A lot of the lines uh, are come up with in the room, and a lot of the uh, dialogue comes out of, like, Mike Henry's mouth as he kind of semi-improvises it. So I don't, you know, I do not have a good, I don't have a good memory for who came up with what line. Uh, I think in many cases the lines that you're, that you're going to probably love are lines that were kind of semi-improvised by people who were recording it at that time. 